So good morning, guys. My name is Ken Bocchino. I'm a professional services consultant with F5 Networks. We have uh, Sam Richman also from F5 Networks and Chuck McCauley from Breaking Point Ixia. Uh, today we're going to talk about the F5 implementation in the Interop NOC. We're going to talk about what we did to, to simulate or actually to create actual attacks on the F5, uh, sorry, on the Interop network. We'll talk a little bit first about who we are, just some basic concepts so that you can uh, appreciate what we're doing in regards to an attack. And then let's go ahead and attack the network. I'll show you four different types of attacks. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how we're mitigating that attack, or those attacks. And then I got some other cool stuff that we've been doing at the Interop network. And uh, if we have time, we'll get into as much of that as possible. So if you haven't been for, uh, familiarized with application delivery, essentially F5 Networks does application delivery. We make sure that you're, you as a content provider, you as an enterprise, can deliver that content and service to your end user, regardless of if service goes down or if you get an immense amount of load into that environment. So we essentially load balance, but we're more application aware. So we can actually make smart, intelligent decisions about where we push that load to. Really basic show of hands, how many people know what a WAF is? All right, so WAF is basically a web application firewall. You think a normal firewall is just that port decision, whether or not to let something go through on port 80, based on source, destination, et cetera. A web application firewall is the ability to inspect the HTTP messages as they pass through it and make intelligent decisions based on uh, anomalies and signatures on whether or not that should pass. So it's protocol aware at the higher levels to determine whether or not they should pass traffic. And this is very important to some of the demos that we're going to be showing you uh, in, in the fact that we actually use this technology to protect the, the environment that you're actually on right now. And the last bit of technology I'm going to speak to briefly before we get into talking about the NOC is what we call at F5 iRules. So iRules give us the ability to uh, trigger based on traffic flow events Let's say when you get a connection to the, the appliance, if you get an HTTP request, we get an HTTP response. And there's a, a, mara, a, ver, a very large variety of different events and techniques uh, that you can actually work with to inspect and use traffic flows to protect the environment. This is very good and powerful for zero day attacks, as well as potentially lining up um, something I'll call about, talk about later, which is the, the high orbit and low orbit ion cannon type technologies in regards to attacks. And then lastly, the, the F5 technology is essentially a full reverse proxy. We have the ability to sit down very low into the initial connection flows coming into us, process uh, advanced rule sets as it rolls all the way up to the top of the stack, and then we talk directly to the backend server. So I think about that technology when I talk about the actual attacks that we're doing. So the Interop network, if you guys aren't familiar with what we do is uh, it's the largest temporary network. It's built in a small warehouse in San Francisco. You can see a little time lapse of us building it this year. Essentially, we get a bunch of engineers together, smart people together to actually work on building the bleeding edge technology, whatever's available at the time, um, within two weeks. And then we put all that technology on a truck and we ship it to right over there into the room around us. And all those engineers are currently sitting in the knock to your left. And Ideally, we want to make sure that we have the most high-performing infrastructure as possible. So you typically go to a conference, you get maybe one megabit per second on your laptop, you get into the corporate network, that's it. We can actually plug a one gigabit laptop into this network and get one gigabit up and one gigabit down. Of course, there's header sizes as well, so you got to take it into account with just TCP traffic flows. But high-performance network essentially is what we're trying to do. We have three co-location facilities, one in Denver, one in San Francisco, which we have connectivity to the show network here, and then one in uh, Newark that will be leveraged when we go into uh, New York. So essentially, we actually have 102 gigabits of connectivity into this network right here from Denver and San Francisco. We have a 100 gigabit link, which is a 4 by 25 optics. So essentially, you can get a 100 gigabit stream going across that link. Uh, that's provided from CenturyLink from uh, the gear over there. If you haven't seen it yet, uh, this top cable right here is 100 gigabits. Any, anyone have a guess as to how, many, how much that optic costs? I think it's 
Over over fifty thousand? Higher? Yeah. So I held it in my hand the other day, it was kind of powerful because it's about you know the cost of a of a, a pretty powerful sports car. It's kinda of neat. Of course that will be like a hundred bucks in, in a year or something like that. It'll be sitting at the bottom of a bunch of lap, uh, laptop bags. Anyways, the network is actually dual stack. We run IPv4 and IPv6. So if you haven't looked yet, if you do an IP config uh, on your laptop, you should have a v4 address and a v6 address. And if you haven't noticed, you've actually been surfing a lot of different pages via v6. So if you go to Google, if you go to Facebook, you're actually writing over the IPv6 uh, protocol network. And then from a routing perspective, we have both, uh, from an IGP perspective, we're running both OSPF v4 v2, which is that v4 uh, address space, and v3. So we're running both uh, within the network. And then on the edge of the network, we're actually running uh, BGP. So we have an iBGP uh, mesh for all the devices that F5 is participating in. And then we have eBGP up those three links that I spoke to earlier. And then we break down the network uh, between core, NOx services, the show floor, and off-show floor networks. So, Within that network, we've provided Viprion platforms. You can see the Viprions right there. We've provided the 8900 platform doing firewall services as well. And then we have some other virtual edition uh, equipment sitting in the colos. And then finally, we also brought in Breaking Point this year. Uh, so Breaking Point is actually, uh, gives us the ability to create packets, uh, in our case, attack packets, uh, against the services here at the, the Interop network. And we have about uh, we have two breaking point devices. You can see it, it's in the bottom, uh, bottom of the rack there. We have one that's physically ha here at the show and one that's actually up in the cloud. So we're going to be running these attacks over that 100 gig link. So here's a, here's a screenshot or a, a diagram at the high level of what the architecture look like, looks like. So on the left side, you see the, the web-based connectivity. You see the two co-locations that, facilities that we have connectivity to. And you can see the 100 gig, 1 gig, and the other 1 gig link down into the show network. And you can see uh, the placement of the attack devices, the breaking points. And you can see that 100 gig link going across into uh, the Viprion platform. So that Viprion platform is providing the, the AFM, or the Advanced Firewall Manager, uh, as well as other DOS vector protection. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later, but we'll get into the attack first. So how many of you have been DOS before? Wow, all right. Uh, how many of you have been DDoS before? You guys know the difference? So the difference between a DOS and a DDoS attack is essentially a DOS attack is a single user coming against you. It's not going to be high load. It potentially is, if, depending on where they're coming from. But their objective is potentially to shut you down without necessarily having to send a lot of traffic. This is more of that SQL injection, slow lowers, those types of attacks that are very strategic uh, and less, there's less of a need from a high, high volume uh, attack. Now your traditional DDoS attack is where you have a command and control system that one person owns or a couple people rent, and you can do this very cheaply. I can spend $100 today and pick a company and DDoS it and have about 10 gigabit of traffic going to their site all day long. 100 bucks, you can do it via PayPal. Um, probably wouldn't want to though. Maybe use Bitcoins instead. So what we traditionally have seen uh, is that single bot network command and control attack. And what we're actually starting to see now, if you look at Anonymous, I'm sure everyone's familiar with what their uh, hijinks have been over the last year, is these campaigns, these attack campaigns, which are, is a breakdown of different groups getting together and saying, we would like to attack this or deny access to these services. It could be a, an organization, a single person, et cetera. And what they're doing is actually crafting a strategy of attacks. Attacks that if they don't or aren't successful, uh, they'll change uh, the, the attack vector space so that they can manipulate the attack over time. And this can happen over period of, periods of 30 minutes. So you can simply say, I'm going to attack the site. If they mitigate that attack, I'm going to attack via this new vector. And what's, what we're finding with that is that a lot of that communication and effort is done fairly publicly because of the tool sets that are out there. You tonight can go and look at who um, anonymous or other hacktivists or organizations want to attack and participate in that attack tonight if you want. Uh, if you do it on this network, you probably get a hundred gig or uh, a gigabit out on the, the low orbit, high orbit ion cannons. And the technique in order to, to do that those attacks is, is fairly simple for that end user. There's video, um, 
YouTube videos on how to run the programs, and then there is a loader file that gives you all the attack information and puts it into the JavaScript that's running it. So if you think about it, you as an enterprise potentially are notified of that attack or can participate in that communication ahead of time to actually get that information as to how they're going to attack you. And with that, you can actually write mitigation techniques to pre prevent those attacks. And again, as I said, that 30 minute window of updating what type of attack structure is, uh, what that attack structure is gonna be, if you pay attention to that, you can play that cat and mouse game too. As soon as a new loader file comes out, you can create a script that will, or a signature that will look for that type of attack and you can block them. So it's a cat and mouse game. It's still effective in regards to pulling resources from your organization into the overall process of defending against DDoS. So I think everyone's fairly familiar with the risks of DDoS. Um, it's not always not only a cost-based uh, problem, it's also reputation-based. Uh, and I think a lot of us as administrators uh, of network security find that there's this internal struggle within your organization between keeping the environment up to just order process and the level of security and intrusion protection that your environment has, where you know you'll rather sac the business would rather sacrifice security for the ability to continue to take orders, which isn't always a good thing when that first attack comes. So I'm going to talk about two different attack types just briefly to, to kind of give everyone a level of knowledge as we go into the attacks. The first one, the one that's a little bit more uh, damaging uh, in regards to working with uh, the application owners and the, the business to protect against is the layer seven attacks. So these are attacks that aren't simply just trying to fill pipe. They aren't simply just trying to take down your network firewall. They are trying to re utilize resources on your web servers, on your middleware servers, or whatever other application service type you're providing. And this is a very difficult challenge for organizations that have advanced application logic that has to process through a database or through other memcached uh, processes on the web servers. And they are also very hard to identify because the attackers will do as much work as possible to try to look, make it look like these are normal requests coming to your shopping cart checkout page, coming to your uh, ATM locator, or any other site, part of the site that they know takes you some time to process through. And we're actually going to run one of these attacks on www.interop.com in like two minutes. So what this looks like is essentially a bunch of requests coming down to normal pages, as I said before, and it's very hard to, to locate. And there's some, some challenges uh, without the proper tool sets to do this, even at the application server level. So there's a couple different attacks that you'll typically see at this space. So how many of you guys are familiar with what a slow Loris attack is? All right, so think about HTTP 1.1. If I send, open up a TCP stream and I send an HTTP GET for the main page, do I technically have to send it all at once? I don't. I could simply put line by line all of the request information and wait to hit enter. And by doing that, I keep the TCP session open and I keep it, a socket open on the web server. So essentially, I'm using the resources of your web server infrastructure. Very little throughput needed and very hard to detect without the right tool sets. The other attack I'm going to talk about briefly is DNS DDoS attack. How many of you guys run an authoritative name server for your organization? How many of you guys have prepared for a DNS DDoS attack? Was that your, was that your DOS before? China was your DOS, OK. <laughs> So if you're an authoritative name server, there's a lot of work you can do to prepare for that, that name server to just be raw on the internet. Uh, you can make sure that it doesn't, uh, isn't susceptible to attack. But at the end of the day, the thing that that server has to do is always respond to the A record request, to the quad A record request for your site. There's nothing you can do to determine whether the person sending that UDP datagram to, to ask for your site name is either an attacker or a real user. So the only way you can mitigate that attack is really to deal with the load and actually respond quick enough. And so one of the attacks that we're going to do briefly here is a, a very, very large DDoS attack. And you'll see that we're able to deal with that quite easily. So obviously that's what that looks like. And there's a couple different strategies for DDoS, doing a DNS DDoS. 
So just to kind of brief you on how we're going to attack this environment, we have the uh, Ixia breaking point device. Again, that's sitting up in Denver. We have 40 gigabits of traffic that that device can generate. And we have another device located here on the external side of the network that will also run. So we'll, we'll, we'll put some traffic on there. We're going to run four different types of attacks. We're going to do a, a flood the pipe scenario. We're going to do a DNS DDoS attack on the same service that you're using right now to resolve interop.com and other sites. We're going to do a uh, application level DDoS attack against www.interop.com. Again, the same site that you guys are going to. And then we're going to do a SQL injection attack against that site and show you one of the largest challenges of being DOS. If you think about the movie Hackers, right, it's about generating enough traffic to keep the administrators busy while you get after what you really want. So you'll see that a DNS, D, or sorry, uh, an application DDoS can mask from a SIM perspective the actual SQL injection attack that might also be going on. So if you ask yourself, okay, if I was being DDoS right now with tens of thousands of requests per second, could I possibly go back in my logs and see who did a SQL injection attack? Would your log server actually be able to keep up with that amount of traffic? So you guys ready? Want to bring it down? All right. All right, so I'm using a couple different tool sets to visualize what this DOS traffic looks like. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, vendors in the interop network that I'm going to pull up their web pages to show you how, how it actually visualizes across the network. Uh, this tool set is called Logstalgia. It's a Google source project. And I'm getting all the, the web logs to this laptop right here. And so you'll see this bounce chart come up in a second. And then this tool set is from CPacket. And what we're actually looking at here is all the taps uh, across the network. So you, you're familiar with the diagram I showed you earlier. On the left side, we see our Denver Colo, our 100 gig link. is a really fat pipe right there. You can see the counters. These are all in, uh, in bits per second. So that's 80, 90 megabits per second. And you can see our other colo links. So let me go bring up the, the Ixia breaking point, And I'm going to go ahead and run a UDP flood against our network. All right, so what you're going to see come up here really quickly here is about 17 gigabits a second of traffic. So we got 15, 16 gigabits going right now. It's going to ramp up. All right, and now you can see we're pushing about 25 gigabits a second of traffic uh, into the network over that 100 gig link from the breaking points. And on the other side of that F5 firewall, Right here, we can see that we're, we're blocking all that traffic. There's about roughly about 140, 150 gigabits, or sorry, 150 megabits of traffic passing through the F5. So we're, we're capable of dealing with that inbound load. And if you guys are browsing the internet, no one's called me right now, no one's screaming over there. The traffic is actually passing through that environment right now. Here is a, a dashboard screenshot, or the active dashboard of the F5 box that we're attacking. You can see we're seeing about 16.8 gigabits of traffic coming in. Um, and we're barely, barely sweating on this one. So this is using our AFM platform to protect against this attack. All right, let's go ahead and do a DNS DDoS. And let's see what we can do on to take down the network there. So again, this is going against www.interop.com from Denver. And we are hitting, hitting the same servers that everyone else is using to resolve all the websites on the, uh, on the show network. All right, you're going to see that pop up. It's not going to be as big of an attack because, uh, again, it takes a little bit more effort to craft and respond to, or craft the DNS request to the breaking point side. There you can see we're running about 2.7 million DNS requests per second. We're answering all of them successfully. It's about seven gigabits of uh, DNS load on the, the infrastructure. And you can see that traffic, it's a little bit smaller than that giant uh, attack we did earlier, but it's still a 
significant amount of, of inbound requests coming. And we can tune this uh, within the environment to actually craft smaller, smaller responses. So we make sure that the only the, the necessary IP address comes back to that A record. So that would reduce it a little bit. Uh, and that, that really is the only way to mitigate a DNS DDoS. The, the servers that are authoritative within the show for interrupt.com are actually Microsoft DNS servers. So if we were to attack the same DNS servers, I'm sure those things would tip over quite easily. All right, and the last attack I'm going to do is going to be that advanced attack of at layer seven against www.interrupt.com. And at the same time, I'm going to do a SQL injection attack, so we can see both. I'm going to ramp up the, uh, the SQL injection attack first, so you can actually see what that looks like, because the visual, visualizer that I'm using has a hard time keeping up with tens of thousands of requests per second in visualizing that. Sorry, I thought I had both of these guys logged into. But while that's running, uh, essentially what you're seeing right here is, um, in a second, it will be the, the, the SQL injection attack. So you can see any of the 503s that we're, we're seeing on the screen are actually blocked attacks on the AFM, or sorry, on the ASM. And essentially, uh, you can also see uh, people going to the website with the 200s. And again, the, the lagginess of this is just with the amount of data it has to process on my laptop. So let's go ahead and run the DDoS now. And this, this gets delayed a little bit with the amount of load coming into it. But we have both a SQL injection attack going right now against the interrupt network, and we're also going to start seeing the, the, the application-based DOS attack. And here comes the DOS. And uh, let me go ahead and go to www.interrupt.com. So we're essentially sending about a gigabit of, of traffic. Uh, we're simulating about 20, 30,000 bots on the internet uh, coming to the interop.com web page. So you guys have a little browser on your site, why don't you try going, or on your phone, why don't you go to interop.com, I'll also do it over here. <laughs> and there we go. So we are attacking and accessing the pages without issue. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the attack. The visualization tool that I use to do this is called Logstalgia. And you can look that up on the Google Source project. So let's talk a little bit. Any questions on the DOS? It's pretty cool. So we, we generated about, uh, at peak, about 20 gigabits per second. I can, uh, based on time, uh, didn't load up the both boxes doing the same attacks. But we can actually run both at the same time, potentially add more blades to the storm center, uh, or uh, storm, firestorm, right? So Sorry, to the firestorm, uh, to actually increase the amount of connections we can, we can attack with. So it's a modular system, so I can put more and more blades in there. So in regards to protection, we actually leverage a couple different modules on the F5 platform. We, we leverage the advanced firewall manager to, to deal with uh, the layer four side of the attack based on HCLs and based on DDoS vectors. And then we also leverage from a, from a DNS DDoS perspective the DNS express functionality of our platform, which allows us to do zone transfers from authoritative name servers into memory. 
and do that on an update from an update perspective. So as you update your Active Directory servers or as you update Bind, we'll get the notify, we'll update the zone, and we'll continue to serve that in memory. And then from an application DOS perspective, that, that the one that you saw the, the cool visualization for, we actually used ASM to protect against that. So the application security manager, that WAF technology that allows us to make intelligent algorithmic decisions on whether or not you could potentially be an attacker. Or if you match a signature file, that dictates that you're trying to do a SQL injection. And this allows us, for those attacks, to investigate further. Ask the, the bot network, or the bot, hey, do you mind doing uh, some simple calculations via JavaScript? And if they don't have JavaScript on, then you're not going to be able to do that math. And it allows you to continue to process normal web actions without impacting your, your, your actual customer. And then finally, as I talked about earlier, we have the iRule technology that allows us to write zero day and more advanced uh, custom signature matches in block traffic. Is any questions on uh, the DOS? So yeah, there's different ways of dealing with memory on our platform and CPU. Um, I didn't pull up the dashboard, but during that attack, we were running about 40 to 50 uh, percent, which is for that type of attack and on the boxes that we're running on, very adequate. Uh, from a from a network-based attack, uh, if you think about sin floods and whatnot, there's a lot of stuff that you can do to remove the necessary memory needs from a connection cable. So sin cookies is one of those. So we. We can deal with a large uh, fuzzing attack. We can deal with a large uh, SIN flood attack um, quite easily and, and without impacting your, your actual user traffic. So other stuff that we've done at the NOC, or within the NOC, is we have the ability to manage, oh, sorry. Uh, so the ASM functionality, okay. Uh, the question was whether or not we were running the ASM technology on the Vipion or on a different platform. The uh, ASM platform, uh, where we actually host www.interop.com is actually on those other 8900. So you saw the Vipion platform protecting everybody, and then we have a services uh, environment that we're uh, sitting behind the uh, 8900s. Uh, and those, uh, those devices are running ASM, AFM, LTM, and GTM. Um, providing some additional functionality for our environment. So, when it comes to managing all of this, uh, we actually have a couple tool sets that we've been working with. Uh, new to our uh, functionality is the Big IQ security module, which allows us, because we have multiple different devices, to manage firewall rule sets in one simple to use interface. I'm going to quickly show you a video of just adding a rule to the environment. So, uh, essentially, I've picked the device that I'm going to. Uh, this is um, basically the main uh, services 8900s that we were talking about a few seconds ago. And uh, this rule is actually going to allow the DePaul campus to come inside of this firewall and firewall environment and do an iperf, uh, do performance testing, essentially. So I've created an access list, or, or an address list, and I'm going to assign it to the bottom of our rule list. So it's a little fuzzy because of how I'm presenting today. Uh, but essentially, I'm dragging and dropping the different sources and destinations over to my rule. And I'm going to then assign the, the port number used, or sorry, the protocol uh, used for this would be UDP. And then essentially I can, I can kind of mock all this up and then deploy that onto, or into the environment. And I'll go ahead and pick the device to deploy to. And essentially now the firewall rule set has been placed within the environment. Another thing that we do uh, over the year is uh, we need to allow all the different vendors access to the environment. So we, we do protect the management interface on an access out-of-band access network, and we do that via SSL VPN connectivity. We also provide portal links for all the different vendors that uh, don't know what services other vendors are providing, portal links so that they can actually log in and work with the environment. So as you saw, like the C packet stuff earlier, um, I, I have links on this portal page that allow me to then go into them. So those are the different vendors here within the Interop network. I'm going ahead and starting a, um, an SSL VPN connection. So you, some of you might have actually seen me do this when I was standing up here because this laptop doesn't have access natively into the, the, the NOC network. 
And the last bits of uh, technology I wanted to talk about that we deployed within the interop network is that DNS caching functionality. So as you're uh, going and browsing around, your recursive lookups are hitting the F5 device, the same one that we attacked. And we talked about DNS Express earlier doing authoritative um, re uh, lookups or responses, even though they're not the actual authoritative servers. Um, we can also do that with uh, recursive resolution. So as you go out to the web, and we will do that recursion and store all that information in memory. So it's not Bind that's doing that, it's actually the DNS caching engine, and that sits in memory. So if you think about it, it gives your enterprise a really powerful tool set from a uh, DNS request per second perspective. If you're a large ISP, you can use this as a LDNS server and actually handle those requests at a high level. And then a little bit about some of the other technologies we've used. Uh, Web Accelerator is actually caching a lot of the interrupt pages. So as you go out and get PowerPoint presentation materials and look at sessions and whatnot, Web Accelerator is actually caching that information for you. So you don't actually have to go out the giant link that we have. I guess it wouldn't hurt too much. But from a latency perspective, you don't have to go out of this network to get that information. And then really quickly, on the just general availability within the NOC, we use and leverage GTM and LTM. So these are platforms that allow us to, as I said earlier, identify and ensure that the web servers and the service servers that we're sending uh, all the different requests to are actually online and available by health checking and are able to deal with load based on spreading that horizontally across the different application service living behind us. And uh, how many are familiar with uh, GTM, our global load balancing? So you guys have, you know, it looks like a lot more people than last year. So it seems like that's catching on a little bit more. So global server load balancing is the ability to actually have more than one data center that you're sending and hosting your application servers in. And what we do there is leverage the DNS uh, technologies in place to identify health of each data center and then via DNS response, respond with the most uh, up-to-date information about health. So we can actually, when this network disappears uh, in two days and gets put back on the trucks, a lot of the vendor uh, services that we pro are, are provided actually live in the co-location facilities that I was talking to earlier. Uh, those GTM, or global load balancing decisions, actually switch when it detects that this environment doesn't exist anymore. And you can simply use the same name, or uh, DNS name, to go and administer or access those services. And then one thing I wanted to illustrate uh, in regards to the flexibility of deploying within uh, the interop NOC network was the ability to actually script and create wizards that you can write your, yourself. We provide a lot on the website, but one of the things that we've done is cu create custom, uh, out of this um, environment, we've gotten challenged by some of the network vendors that come to create new functionality. Um, one of those is, if you think about the show, we have a bunch of network vendors here that do really good monitoring services. And the way they do that is by getting SNMP traps, by getting NetFlow data, by getting syslog data. And because we have a lot of those different vendors that come in year over year, we can actually reduce the requirement for each network device to send syslog to five or six different places, as well as prevent, you, uh, prevent everyone from having to reconfigure the syslog uh, or their NetFlow destinations every time a new vendor comes in. So we actually wrote a couple years ago some logic with iRules uh, that allows us to duplicate UDP data uh, that comes to us to subscribers. So essentially, use us as a syslog destination, NetFlow destination, an SNMP destination, and then we can just make a decision on the F5 device where to send that to. And what I just wanted to close with or illustrate uh, is how easy it is to actually deploy that type of technology from an IAP perspective. Just quickly answer a few questions and then allow that to be deployed within the environment. So here we're just running through that wizard. It's asking us which template we want to use. We put in the name, so this is I'm setting up a syslog uh, um, distribution point. I put in the IP address that I want to have all my syslogs sent to on the F5 side. And now I can actually configure multiple destinations that are going to receive, um, receive traps or receive the, the syslog data. And I can do this for any type of UDP data. Uh, and re-enter re the same uh, wizard to change it later. So we have a bunch of those out on the website. How many of you guys are F5 customers already? Wow, all right. Have you guys seen iApps before? Not as many. So uh, if you are repeating the same deployments for your application team and you're, you're getting good at getting them to provide you the right information, 
you can have your you can write an I app that says, okay, take the bits of information that change every time I get a request to add a new uh, uh, virtual server and pool, and simply plug that into the I app and hit deploy. And you can see I've just done that, and it's created all the different objects that are required. It created my pool, it created my pool monitor, it created my virtual server, it created all the profiles that I need, it created the SSL certificates if I wanted to. This one doesn't. Uh, and then I can go back and change it, which I just did, and redeploy it. So as the web application owner comes back to you and says, well, I uh, gave you the wrong IP address, I'm sorry. You don't have to go back and actually change all that within the configuration manually. You can simply go and change the answers that you've, uh, you've answered and redeploy. So if you guys haven't looked at this or played with it, uh, it's a really powerful tool when it comes to the operational perspective of deploying hundreds of different virtual servers on a weekly basis.